very early stage uh, in the uh, Soviet-German War, the Great Patriotic War. By May 1940, 170 Soviet divisions were stationed in newly occupied territory. Amid the Winter War, a Soviet division ventured into the wilderness and encountered an evil that remains shrouded in mystery to this day. While some believe this horrific event was caused by a creature of the night, others are convinced it was a strategic ambush by the Finnish forces. Yet no one holds the truth about the nature of this ominous attack. What events led to the horror of this fateful night? And why was the Soviet division specifically targeted? Join us as we reveal the Soviet division that was massacred by something unknown in Finland during 1939. The tense history between Russia and Finland. The Winter War, a conflict that erupted between the Soviet Union and Finland in November 1939, stands as a testament to the resilience of a nation outmatched in numbers, yet unyielding in spirit. This confrontation wasn't just about territory. It was a clash of ideologies and wills set against the chilling backdrop of the Finnish winter. The tensions leading to the Winter War were deeply rooted in the aftermath of World War I and the Russian Civil War. Finland had gained independence from Russia in 1917, but under Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union sought to reclaim lost territories and create a buffer zone against potential invasions. Stalin, who rose to power in the late 1920s, perceived Finland as a potential threat. He harbored concerns that Finland might align with Germany and allow German troops to launch attacks on the USSR from Finnish territory. Additionally, the proximity of Finland's borders to St. Petersburg, then known as Leningrad, and the Murmansk-Leningrad Railway made the Treaty of Tartu precarious. According to reports, the Soviet Red Army initiated the construction of railways toward the Finnish border around 1935, with the intention of facilitating a potential invasion. These actions underscored growing tensions between Finland and the Soviet Union in the lead-up to World War II. In 1938 and 1939, Soviet diplomats approached Finland, seeking a new treaty to ensure Finnish support in case of a German invasion. Stalin, in the aftermath of the Great Purge, sought allies but faced rejection from France and the UK. Consequently, he turned to Hitler and signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, effectively carving up Eastern Europe into spheres of influence, with the USSR gaining control over Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Eastern Poland. Concerned by these developments, Finland sought to form a Scandinavian alliance, hoping for Swedish support. However, Sweden yielded to German and Soviet pressures, shattering Finland's hopes. When Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939, triggering World War II, Britain and France responded by declaring war on Hitler. Shortly after, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east, leading to its complete occupation. Stalin swiftly demanded military access from the Baltic countries, which acquiesced, allowing Soviet troops to establish bases. In response, Finland bolstered the construction of the Mannerheim Line, adding 150 concrete bunkers. On October 5, 1939, Stalin summoned a Finnish delegation to Moscow, demanding territorial concessions, including moving the border northwest, ceding islands in the Gulf of Finland, granting military bases, and destroying fortifications on the Karelian Isthmus. In return, Finland would receive Rapola and Porajarvi. The Soviet demands for Finnish territory, particularly the Karelian Isthmus near Leningrad, were met with staunch resistance by the Finnish government. Both sides began mobilizing under the pretext of training, while Finland evacuated civilians from vulnerable areas. These escalating tensions set the stage for the winter war between Finland and the Soviet Union. The conflict erupted on November 30, 1939, when the Soviet Union launched a full-scale invasion of Finland following an acclaimed shelling incident at Manila, which the Soviets used as a pretext. Recent investigations have revealed that the Manila bombing was, in fact, a false flag operation orchestrated by the USSR to blame Finland. On November 29, the Soviets severed diplomatic ties with Finland and the following day renounced the non-aggression pact between the two nations, officially igniting the Winter War. The Soviet forces, under the command of Maretskov, 
a seasoned veteran of the Spanish Civil War, were well prepared. The Seventh Army, led by Yakovlev, boasted nine infantry divisions, along with tank and armored brigades. Their objective was to capture the Karelian Isthmus and Vipuri before advancing on Helsinki. Despite being aware of the Mannerheim Line, the Soviets lacked detailed information, leading them to believe they could achieve their goals within three weeks, a timeline deemed overly optimistic. Meanwhile, the Eighth Army, commanded by Khabarov, aimed to advance north of Lake Ladoga, either penetrating deep into Finnish territory or attacking the Karelian Isthmus defenders from the rear. The Ninth Army, led by Duhanov, had the task of seizing Kajani and Ulu, effectively dividing Finland in two. In the Northern Front, Frolov's 14th Army, supported by the Soviet Northern Fleet, was ordered to capture Petsamo to prevent potential interventions from Norway or the Barents Sea before turning south towards Rovaniemi. Despite condemnation from the international community, Finland stood almost alone against the Red Army's might. The Finns were heavily outnumbered, possessing only a fraction of the soldiers and resources. In total, the Soviet army boasted an impressive force of 425,000 soldiers, backed by 3,000 artillery pieces, 2,300 tanks, and 2,500 aircraft. In contrast, Finland had only 14 divisions, totaling 265,000 soldiers, making the odds seem daunting. Indeed, the Soviet strategy was ambitious, but Finland was determined to defend its sovereignty against overwhelming odds. How Finland Repelled the Soviets Under the command of General Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim, the Finnish forces mounted a formidable defense. They utilized their intimate knowledge of the terrain and employed guerrilla tactics and strategic withdrawals to their advantage. The Mannerheim Line, a series of fortifications along the Karelian Isthmus, became a symbol of Finnish resistance. Commanded by Osterman, the Army of the Isthmus comprised six divisions, with the 3rd Army Corps on the left flank and the 2nd Army Corps on the right. Further north, the 4th Army Corps, led by Heiskanen, held two divisions, while the Northern Finland Group, under Tuampo, consisted of border guards, reservists, and former members of the White Guard. As the Soviet forces advanced, the Finnish troops faced the challenge of plugging gaps in their defenses. Attempting to halt the Soviet advance on the Lametti Road proved futile, leading the leaders of the Finnish 13th Division to launch an attack towards Mitro in an effort to divide the Soviet 18th Division. While this seemed like a logical move, their two-pronged attack failed, resulting in another Finnish retreat with casualties. Exploiting this retreat, the Soviets swiftly mobilized units from the 18th Division, seizing Ruokajärvi and advancing to the southern shore of Lake Siskijärvi. The Finns, undeterred, launched another counterattack towards Mitro, but once again, they were pushed back by the Soviet forces. The battles on the ground were intense, with both sides fighting fiercely for control. Despite the Finnish forces' determination, they found themselves outmatched by the sheer size and strength of the Soviet army. The harsh winter conditions, however, played into Finnish hands, with temperatures dropping as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius, significantly hampering the Soviet advance. The Red Army, though superior in numbers and equipment, was ill-prepared for the extreme cold and the dense forests and swamps that characterized the Finnish landscape. The Soviets, therefore, faced significant casualties from frostbite. In the early hours of December 17th, the Finns managed to retake Ruokojärvi and the surrounding territory near Siskijärvi. Task Force Archer was then shifted westward in an attempt to disrupt the Soviet supply lines southeast of Lake Siskijärvi. Their efforts proved successful on the 18th, as they managed to cut off the Soviet supply routes, compelling the Soviets to divert more troops from the southeast to restore their communication lines. This diversion, however, meant that the Soviet divisions were deprived of the reinforcements they desperately needed. Seizing this opportunity, the Finns launched attacks across the front, forcing the Soviets to defend themselves for the first time since the war began. Despite the Soviet success in defending their positions, Task Force Bullet launched an attack to the southeast on the 27th, capturing Uoma and effectively cutting off the Lametti Road, disrupting the rapid supply of Soviet divisions. 
Soviet tactics, heavily reliant on large conventional formations and direct assaults, proved ineffective against the mobile and elusive Finnish units. Additionally, the purges of the 1930s had decimated the Soviet officer corps, leaving the Red Army with a leadership deficit that critically impacted its operational capabilities. The Red Army's repeated attempts to retake Uama proved futile, with the 168th and 18th Divisions coming under relentless attack. By early January, the Soviet salient at Siskijarvi was pushed back onto the Lametti Road. Although outnumbered, the Finns' resilient defense and strategic raids not only halted the Soviet advance, but also created an opportunity for the Finns to launch their own offensive in January 1940. Meanwhile, north of Lake Swojarvi, the Soviets, led by the 1st Rifle Corps, pushed the Finns back 60 kilometers from the border. This region was vital for the Finns, as further withdrawal would have exposed the troops around Ladoga to attacks from the north. To counter this threat, Mannerheim appointed Colonel Talvela to lead and reinforce the troops collectively known as the Talvela Group. Talvela, a war hero, boosted morale among the Finnish forces. Despite Talvela's appointment, the Soviets continued their advance, seizing the river crossing above Kivisalmi on December 8. In response, Talvela initiated a bold counterattack known as Task Force Pajari on the night of December 9. A third of the unit engaged the Soviet forces through Kivisalmi, while the remainder crossed the lake and launched a surprise attack on the 139th Enemy Division from the south. The unexpected assault caught the Soviets off guard, resulting in losses from both enemy fire and friendly fire in the ensuing confusion, which persisted even after Task Force Pajari returned to its initial positions. This bold move significantly lifted morale among the Finnish troops. Similar to other fronts, the Red Army advanced too swiftly in this region, leading to overstretched supply lines and difficulties in launching subsequent attacks. Despite requesting reinforcements, the nature of the war meant that support would arrive much later. While most Soviet troops required rest, this lull allowed their Finnish adversaries to fortify their positions. In the north, the Finnish forces managed to halt the advance of the Soviet 155th Division. However, a more pressing threat emerged with the arrival of the Soviet 718th Regiment in the central area of the Finnish line, posing a risk to the front's integrity. Swinging westward around the village of Tolva Yarvi, the 718th Regiment surprised and encircled the Finnish defenders. Yet their assault came to an abrupt halt when they reached the Finnish soup kitchens. Exhausted after a grueling five-day march, the hungry Soviet soldiers abandoned their weapons and indulged in a hot sausage stew. This unexpected turn of events provided the Finns with a crucial opportunity to regroup and receive reinforcements. The End of the Winter War Under the leadership of Colonel Aro Pajari, the Finns launched a surprise counterattack on the night of December 10th, swiftly escalating into fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. By dawn, the 718th Regiment had been decisively repelled, with over a hundred Soviet soldiers lying in the snow, some still clutching pieces of sausage. Pajari's surprise assault proved so effective that some enemy soldiers were found deceased with food still in their mouths. Following the so-called Sausage War, certain Red Army units in the south attempted to aid the retreating 718th Regiment, but were thwarted in the Tolvajarvi Lake area, suffering hundreds more casualties. Although Talvela was eager to capitalize on this wave of victories, his troops were as fatigued as their adversaries, resulting in a temporary lull at the front on the 11th. The Finns had a counterattack planned for the following day. Task Force M would launch a frontal assault north of the village of Tolva Yarvi, while Pajari's forces would strike from the flank. This strategy proved effective as the Soviets were compelled to retreat, suffering over 1,000 casualties and losing valuable equipment compared to the 300 Finnish losses. The relentless pressure exerted by the Finns prompted Soviet leaders to deploy the 75th Division from Swojarvi to support the retreating 139th Division. This move led to the replacement of Khabarov with Stern, but even his strict disciplinary measures failed to bolster the morale of his troops. The Finnish offensive persisted, advancing until they reached the village of Agla Yarvi by the 16th, 
forcing even fresh Soviet troops eastward. Both sides escalated troop deployment in the area over the subsequent days. Despite holding the initiative, Finnish attacks on the 18th and 19th were unsuccessful. On the 20th, the Soviets introduced tanks into the village, initiating a counterattack. However, Finnish anti-tank guns proved devastating, destroying the tanks and enabling the Finns to mount their own counteroffensive. By day's end, Red Army troops were entrenched in the town. Although the Soviet air forces conducted airstrikes during this period, the dense forest terrain rendered their attacks ineffective. Finnish efforts to capture the village persisted, culminating in the Soviet leadership issuing a withdrawal order to the Itojoki River on December 21st. The Finns attempted to intercept the retreating forces, inflicting significant casualties, but ultimately failed to encircle them. Nevertheless, Aglayarvi marked the Mannerheim army's first major victory of the war. Soviet losses totaled around 6,000, 500 men, while Finnish casualties numbered less than 800. The Winter War persisted and drew international attention, with Finland garnering sympathy and support from various countries. Material aid from France, the United Kingdom, and the United States was limited, but volunteers from across Scandinavia and other parts of the world joined the Finnish ranks. The most significant assistance came in the form of weapons and munitions. After several more months, the conflict eventually concluded with the signing of the Moscow Peace Treaty on March 12, 9040. Finland was forced to cede 11% of its territory to the Soviet Union, including the entire Karelian Isthmus and parts of Sala and Petsamo. Despite these territorial losses, Finland preserved its independence and demonstrated to the world the potential for a smaller nation to resist a larger aggressor. The Winter War left an indelible mark on Finnish and Soviet military history, influencing tactics, strategy, and international perceptions. For Finland, the war fostered a sense of national unity and resilience embodied in the term Sisu, a unique Finnish concept denoting extraordinary determination and grit. On the Soviet side, the embarrassing performance of the Red Army led to significant military reforms that would have implications for its effectiveness in World War II. Amidst the political and military maneuvers, one haunting event stands out. In 1939, a Soviet division stationed near the border experienced a night of horror in the Finnish forests. The eerie silence was shattered as they fell victim to a harrowing ordeal, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of military history. The strange night of the Soviet division massacre. Now, let's dive into the eerie night when an entire Soviet unit faced a mysterious fate, an event still wrapped in mystery and speculation. The Soviet division that was massacred by something unknown in Finland during 1939. This Soviet division, part of the massive force invading Finland during the Winter War, had marched into Finnish territory with the confidence of a powerful military. Their goal was to secure strategic positions and crush Finnish resistance. However, the harsh Finnish winter and the dense, shadowy forests presented unforeseen challenges turning the environment into as much of an adversary as the Finnish defenders themselves. On that fateful night, the division had set up camp in a dense woodland area, unaware of the ordeal awaiting them. Despite their numbers and the might of the Red Army, the soldiers were already grappling with the biting cold and dwindling supplies. As night descended, a palpable sense of unease crept over the camp. Initially dismissed as mere jitters, this unease soon escalated into sheer terror, Survivor accounts, pieced together from scattered reports and second-hand testimonies, describe a sudden and violent onslaught that struck without warning. The assailant, described only as an unknown entity, descended upon the camp with ferocity. Witnesses spoke of shadows moving with unnatural speed, screams piercing the night, and a force so overwhelming it seemed to embody the very essence of the wintry forest's malice. The Soviet soldiers, trained for battle against a human enemy, found themselves utterly unprepared for the chaos that ensued. Attempts to organize a defense were futile. The enemy, if it could be called that, remained elusive in the darkness of the night and the dense forest, making it impossible to ascertain its nature. When dawn broke, the extent of the massacre became apparent. The campsite was a scene of carnage, with tents torn apart, equipment scattered, 
and snow stained dark with blood. Some soldiers were mutilated beyond recognition, while others lay lifeless with no visible injuries. Initial assumptions pointed to a guerrilla attack by Finnish forces, but this theory was quickly questioned. The nature of the injuries, the absence of defensive wounds, and the lack of evidence of a large attacking force confounded military analysts and investigators. Speculation abounded, with some suggesting supernatural forces or a psychological operation by the Finns, but concrete evidence remained elusive. In the aftermath, a Soviet military investigation sought to uncover the truth behind the night's events, but faced numerous obstacles, including the reticence of traumatized survivors. The Finnish side denied involvement, attributing the massacre to Soviet paranoia and environmental conditions. Eyewitness accounts and Soviet records offer only a fragmented glimpse into the enigmatic events of that night. Why further information on the massacre was withheld. The survivors' accounts of that haunting night, while varied and sometimes contradictory, share a common thread of confusion, fear, and encounters with an unseen adversary. Soldiers described hearing unsettling noises in the dark, whispers seeming to come from nowhere and everywhere at once, and sudden chilling screams piercing the cold night air. One testimony recounted how the air thickened, making it difficult to breathe or move as panic set in. Another spoke of seeing shapes moving at the edge of the campfire's light, too fast and fluid to be human, yet too deliberate to dismiss as mere shadows or the wind through the trees. The survivors spoke of a profound sense of dread, almost tangible, enveloping the camp and its inhabitants in a suffocating embrace. The Soviet military archives regarding the incident are notably scant and heavily redacted, reflecting the official desire to suppress information deemed harmful to morale or a failing on the part of the Red Army. What little information can be gleaned from these records suggests a rapid and thorough investigation by Soviet authorities, though the conclusions drawn remain classified or are simply missing from the public record. The archives make brief mention of the division's deployment and its mission objectives, followed by a sudden break in communication and subsequent vague entries speaking of tragic loss and unforeseen circumstances with no detailed account of the event. The discrepancies between eyewitness accounts and the sparse details from Soviet records have, however, fueled speculation and theories about what truly happened. Some researchers suggest that the official Soviet response was an attempt to cover up an encounter with something beyond the understanding or control of military leadership, possibly to avoid undermining the perceived invincibility of the Red Army. Others argue that the inconsistencies and lack of detail may be attributable to the chaos of war and the desire to forget or move past an unexplainable tragedy. The fact that the incident was not widely reported or acknowledged in Soviet military history has led to suggestions that it was considered an embarrassment, a blemish on the record of the Red Army that was best left unexamined. The role of censorship and propaganda in shaping the narrative cannot be understated. The Soviet Union, particularly under Stalin's regime, was notorious for its control over information and its efforts to craft a narrative of strength and infallibility. It is possible that any records or testimonies contradicting the official line were suppressed or altered to fit the desired image. This manipulation of information extends to the accounts of survivors themselves, who may have been coerced into silence or persuaded to alter their stories to match the official version of events. The fear of reprisal combined with the trauma of the experience may have led many to withhold information or speak only in terms that would not invite further scrutiny. Before we continue, let's have our subscribers pick. On the Soviet division that was massacred by something unknown in Finland during 1939. These images offer a glimpse into the chilling events of the Soviet Union massacre, sparking various interpretations and raising unsettling questions. One particularly haunting image depicts Finnish soldiers showcasing the skin of a Russian soldier, allegedly cannibalized by his fellow comrades. While skepticism surrounds the authenticity of this photo, many sources affirm its genuineness, adding another layer of horror to an already grim narrative. The revelation of such brutality though kept from public view at the time, sends shockwaves through society and prompts a reevaluation of the entire incident. Could it be that amidst the chaos of war, 
The perpetrators of the massacre were not foreign enemies, but rather fellow Soviet soldiers turned against each other. What do you think of the possibility of this narrative? Do share your thoughts in the comment section below. Speculations Explaining the strange massacre of the Soviet soldiers In the aftermath of the harrowing massacre of a Soviet division in the dense forests of Finland during the Winter War, a multitude of theories has emerged. One of the more grounded theories suggests that the division fell victim to a pack of wolves or other predatory animals driven to desperation by the harsh Finnish winter. Another theory posits that extreme weather conditions may have led to panic and chaos within the camp, resulting in self-inflicted casualties. The possibility of a covert Finnish military operation designed to sow fear and confusion among Soviet ranks has also been considered. This theory suggests that the Finns, adept in guerrilla warfare and intimately familiar with the terrain, executed a surprise attack on the Soviet division using psychological warfare tactics. While intriguing, this theory lacks concrete evidence, and Finnish military records from the period do not corroborate the existence of such an operation. In the realm of more speculative explanations, some have suggested the involvement of supernatural entities, drawing on Finnish folklore that speaks of spirits and creatures haunting the forests. Tales of the HRA, a seductive forest spirit, and other mythical beings have been woven into the narrative, proposing that the soldiers encountered forces beyond human comprehension. While captivating, this theory lacks physical evidence and is largely dismissed by historians. However, it underscores the depth of the mystery and the human tendency to seek explanations in the unknown. A more psychological explanation theorizes that the combination of extreme stress, isolation, and fear led to a situation of mass hysteria among the troops. Theories suggest that stories of Finnish supernatural warfare tactics might have circulated among the Soviet soldiers, priming them for a psychological break. This heightened anxiety could have culminated in a tragic spiral of fear-induced violence, where soldiers turned on each other in a frenzy of paranoia and confusion. Another line of inquiry points to the potential use of chemical or biological agents, either as a result of Soviet mishandling or a deliberate attack by the Finns. The theory suggests that exposure to a toxic substance could have led to the disorientation and subsequent demise of the troops. However, there is no historical evidence to suggest that such weapons were deployed by either side during the Winter War, making this theory less plausible. Other Bizarre Unexplainable Events Similar historical mysteries abound in the annals of military history, each challenging our understanding of what happened and why. One such mystery is the Dyatlov Pass incident, one of the most famous mysteries in Soviet history. It involved the unexplained deaths of nine hikers in the northern Ural Mountains. Much like the soldiers in Finland, the hikers were found dead under mysterious circumstances, with theories ranging from avalanches to military tests and even unidentified flying objects. In the early stages of World War II, Residents of Los Angeles were awoken by air raid sirens and anti-aircraft gunfire aimed at what was believed to be an enemy attack. However, no enemy aircraft were ever identified, leading to theories ranging from a false alarm due to war nerves to more outlandish ideas involving extraterrestrial spacecraft. The Bermuda Triangle, infamous for the mysterious disappearance of ships and aircraft, presents another enigma. Flight 19, a group of five U.S. Navy bombers on a training flight in 1945 vanished without a trace, leading to speculation about the Triangle's purportedly supernatural properties. During World War I, stories also emerged of angelic figures appearing over British soldiers at the Battle of Mons, allegedly protecting them from advancing German forces. Although later attributed to folklore and psychological strain, the Angels of Mons story shares elements with the Finnish incident in its blend of warfare, mystery, and the supernatural. While not a mystery in the traditional sense, the story of the Ghost Army, an allied unit tasked with deceiving German forces through illusion and misdirection, illustrates the power of psychological warfare. Similar to the theories surrounding the Finnish operation, the Ghost Army used deception to achieve military objectives, highlighting the role of the unknown in the dynamics of conflict. The possibility of Finland using psychological warfare. Psychological warfare, 
an ancient facet of conflict, seeks to undermine an enemy's morale and will to fight without engaging in physical combat. The use of fear, superstition, and folklore as tools in this endeavor has been well documented across various military conflicts, including the chilling events surrounding the massacre of a Soviet division in the Finnish forests during the Winter War. Indeed, psychological warfare aims to exploit vulnerabilities in the human psyche, leveraging fear and uncertainty to sow discord and fear among enemy ranks. In the context of the Winter War, the isolated and harsh environment of the Finnish forests could have provided fertile ground for such tactics. The Finns, vastly outnumbered, may have truly resorted to ingenious methods to compensate for their lack of manpower and resources, one of which was leveraging the psychological impact of the unfamiliar and eerie landscape on the Soviet troops. Soldiers, facing the daily possibility of death, often turned to superstitions and rituals for comfort and a sense of control over their fate. The Soviet soldiers, many from diverse backgrounds across the vast Soviet Union, brought with them a tapestry of beliefs and superstitions. The introduction of local Finnish folklore into this mix of fears and beliefs could have exacerbated the psychological strain on the troops, making them more susceptible to panic and irrational behavior. Finnish folklore is rich with tales of spirits and creatures inhabiting the forests, tales likely well known to the local population, but alien and potentially terrifying to the invading Soviet soldiers. The possibility that the Finns deliberately spread rumors or staged events to invoke these folkloric beings should not be underestimated. Such tactics could have been designed to exploit the superstitions of the Soviet soldiers, amplifying their fears of the unknown and the supernatural, thereby undermining their morale. The dense forests of Finland, with their limited visibility and constant presence of natural sounds that could be misconstrued as threats, created an environment ripe for psychological manipulation. Isolation from familiar surroundings and the breakdown of regular communication channels could lead to a heightened state of anxiety and paranoia, making soldiers more receptive to rumors and fearful imaginings. In such a setting, the line between reality and superstition can blur, making psychological warfare all the more effective. The use of psychological warfare and the manipulation of superstition and folklore have historical precedents. During World War II, the Allies used ghost soldiers and inflatable tanks as part of Operation Quicksilver to create the illusion of a large force preparing to invade northern France, deceiving German reconnaissance. While materially different from invoking folkloric fears, the underlying principle of exploiting the enemy's psychological vulnerabilities remains the same. The aftermath of the massacre, with its lack of conclusive evidence and mysterious circumstances surrounding the deaths, only served to deepen the psychological impact on Soviet forces in Finland. The rumors and stories that emerged likely had a lasting effect on the morale of Soviet troops, contributing to the folklore and mystique of the Finnish forests. This legacy underscores the power of psychological tactics and the enduring impact of fear and superstition on the human psyche in the context of military conflicts. Thanks for watching. See you in our next video.